Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Flamingo, our secure aggregation system built for federated learning tasks. This is a joint work with Jess, Sebastian, Antigone, and Tao. Online services we use every day heavily rely on analyzing user data to provide customized functionalities. Exam examples include spam filters, tax predictions, shopping recommendations, and more. Uh, in recent years, machine learning becomes especially popular in building prediction models in this process. For instance, Gmail uses machine learning powered by user feedback to better detect spams. The process of building model is conceptually very simple. First, a central server will collect data from user devices. Then it runs machine learning algorithm on the collected data to train the model. After the training, the model is deployed in the app for services. But as you can see here, to train a model, the server has to collect thousands of users' data, and this is so-called centralized training. McMahon and all proposed federated learning to mitigate the user data privacy issue. So here, many clients can collaboratively train a model without handing their data to the server. So this decentralized pattern also works in three steps. First, each client runs a model update algorithm on its data locally and produces a global a, a mo a local update, or so-called local weights. You can think of these weights as long vectors. And then the weights are sent to the central server in the clicker. Next, the server simply adds them up and average it to get a global update, or so-called global weights. Um, so the process I described is just one iteration in the training. And in the full training session, such summation procedure needs to run for many, many times on different sets of clients until the model converges. So this is a very elegant idea to uh, address uh, privacy issues, but researchers later on found security issues regarding this decentralized training pattern, with the two mainstream attacks uh, being data inference attacks and poison attacks. Uh, the first type of attack means that the server can infer information of individual client's data by observing the local weights. And in this work, we deal with the first type, and the second type of attack means that the server uh, is about malicious inputs, uh, which is orthogonal to this work, and also is addressed by uh, people in previous talk. So to prevent the server from seeing the local weights, prior work proposed using secure aggregation to perform the summation in a private way. So crucially, a secure aggregation protocol allows the server to compute a sum of inputs from clients without learning anything beyond the sum and what is implied by the sum. As you can see from the references here, there are many existing protocols for secure aggregation under different cryptographic assumptions designed under different communication models. However, applying them in a black box way here may not result in a good solution. The reason is that federated learning has many stringent constraints from both the federation property and the machine learning setting. So let's take a closer look. A key feature of federated learning is that clients are the main participants instead of the server. So they're mobile devices, they have limited computation resources, and they may get disconnected to the network at any point during the execution. So a desired protocol should have lightweight computation for clients. And when some client quit in the middle of the computation, the protocol should still continue and eventually output a sum of the local weights uh, from clients that stays online. The machine learning setting makes protocol design even more challenging. Um, so to feasibly run secure aggregation for an entire training, the protocol should be de efficient despite large parameters in the three dimensions I listed here. Some recent work show effective technique to deal with the large inputs, scale to many participants, and meet the requirement of the mobile clients. However, these protocols are designed for computing single sum. You may think that we can simply repeat them to compute many sums in the training, but it's actually not ideal. The reason is that a sum in these protocols require multiple server client round trips, with some of them being especially expensive. So our goal is to push secure aggregation to efficiently run for an entire training session and at the meantime, even improve the efficiency that people achieve in the single sum protocol. And we achieve this goal by reducing the number of round trips, especially those expensive ones. But here I want to first highlight why this is doubly important in federated learning. 
as I mentioned before, clients are extremely unstable, and when a client goes offline in the middle of the computation, the server has to continue without waiting for it to come back. As a result, one more round trip could mean more dropout devices. So reducing the number of round trips does not only improve the runtime, more importantly, it includes more inputs in the sum and reduces the bias towards the stable and powerful devices. The second reason is more straightforward, because private sum is essentially MPC, where some interactions are inevitable. But since we target for multiple sums, it's nice if we can design a protocol that has fewer round trips overall compared to repeating the existing single sum protocols. So we propose Flamingo, which fits all these efficiency needs uh, while preserving the security that people achieved in prior work. In particular, uh, having fewer round trips allows us to scale to an entire training session, and clients in our system only needs to be online for one specific step to have their inputs included, so we sort of eliminate the bias as much as possible. Our protocol is based on two key ideas. Uh, the starting point is a fault-tolerant private sound protocol, uh, which is based on two classical cryptographic ideas. The first one is a pairwise canceling trick used in DCNet, and the second one is distributed decryption. Then we're able to extend this protocol to efficiently run many sums by reusing the pairwise secrets. Actually, the two key ideas are not independent. As we will see later, the design of this fault-tolerant protocol allows us to do a simple modification to reuse the secrets. To start with, let's say we have three clients, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. They each hold a vector, which is the local weights, and the server wants to compute x1 plus x2 plus x3. The first step in the protocol, which we also call the setup phase, is to establish pairwise secrets between each two of them. For example, x12 is only known to Alice and Bob. This setup is relatively expensive, and in previous work, this is easier done by setting up a PKI or a few interactions between the server and clients. But once the setup is done, each client only does a cheap operation um, uh, to mask the vector. So it uses the short secrets uh, to mask the long vector by stretching the secret using a pseudorandom generator. The masking is done in a special way such that when uh, these vectors add up together, the masks will cancel each other out and it will give us the sum of x i's. So basically, the server just asks the client i to send vector v i and adds them up. So this simple design already gives us efficient client-side computation despite the inputs are large, and this idea can be generalized to more clients. But as you might observe, when the server asks Charlie to send v3, it could be the case that Charlie went offline, didn't send anything. So in this case, the server only gets v1 and v2, but adding them together will not give us anything useful. The reason is that only the masks are associated with S12 are canceling each other. The masks are associated with Charlie are still there. But what we want in the protocol is that the server can compute X1 plus X2 so that we're not wasting effort from Alice and Bob. Um, the idea here being that we can actually reveal the secrets associated with Charlie, and this is still private for the instance I gave here, uh, because X1 is masked with S12, and so that's X2. Of course, exposing secrets may cause other issues, and we have more techniques to deal with it, but for now, let's stick to this example. So our technique to handle dropouts is to have each client append the public key encryption of the secrets and uh, submit them together to the server. So if Charlie is offline and Alice is online, and then uh, the, the server will be able to get an encryption of the pairwise secrets from Alice's submission. So how can the server recover the secrets? This is why we introduce special decryption here. So the secret key associated with PK is secret shared among a small set of clients, which we call decryptors. Um, so you may have questions regarding how they're chosen and how SK is shared. Uh, I'll not cover this part due to time limit. Please check them out in the paper. Now the server, after getting v1 and v2, can simply ask the decryptors to recover S12 and S23 and subtract them from the vectors and get X1 plus X2. Moreover, such recovery process in our protocol only require one third of the decryptors to respond and the secrets are small. So basically the computation at a decryptor is rather lightweight. Now we're coming to the second idea. 
if we trivially repeat the previous protocol, it's not secure at all because these masks are essentially one-time paths. But we only need a slight modification. Say we're in iteration T in the training process, each client compute an iteration-specific secret by applying PRF on the pairwise secrets and the iteration number. And then the iteration-specific secret is appended to the vector. So if Charlie went offline, the server just asks the decryptors to recover the iteration-specific secrets instead of the original pairwise secrets. As a result, the setup phase will never need to run again. This idea looks very simple, but unfortunately it's not uh, actually compatible with some previous work due to a crucial difference of the fault tolerance design. There are many interesting details here, but I need to skip it now. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it offline. So to summarize, with the two key ideas, we can do the costly setup once and then run the private sum uh, many times efficiently. There are more details in the paper. Uh, please check them out. Um, finally, I will touch on the evaluation results. I would like to first highlight that Server computation is the main focus uh, of most of the prior work. While it's important, we show that what matters is actually the number of round trips. To see why, let's take a look at how the server and the clients interact in a protocol. So the server first selects a set of clients and asks them to send messages and waits for a fixed amount of time until it gets a desired fraction of messages, say from 99% of clients. Then the server decides to proceed and processes the messages. This is one round trip in the protocol. Then the server contacts the set clients again and starts the next round trip. The next round trip. Um, so because the server computation, namely the time to process the messages are made quite small by our work and previous work, so what actually matters is the round trips. So you can see here from the left figure, the reduction of this complexity gives us five to six, improvement over prior work, and we almost have no accuracy loss compared to the non-private baseline. Uh, to summarize, we design and build a system, a secure aggregation system that can efficiently run uh, on standard data sets. And in the future, there are many interesting directions to explore. And this concludes my talk, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks for your talk. Uh, my question is, what is the complexity of the decryptor? Does it depend on the number of clients? Right, this is a very good question. Uh, so our protocol highly relies on the actual like concrete parameters in the training process. For example, each uh, batch, or like each batch, in the, each generation in the uh, protocol only requires like 100 clients, 200 clients. And this is relatively small compared to the vector lens. So basically, the decryptors uh, does decryption for, for example, uh, 200 clients, but this is not so expensive compared to masking a vector with uh, 10,000 or something like that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, good talk. I had a question. How is it fundamentally different than uh, previous works where uh, they were using threshold secret sharing rather than threshold decryption? Because it seems like there also you could use these uh, this expensive setup across rounds by mm -hmm. using the non-strict that you described, right? Yeah, great question. So the key difference is communication cost because uh, the inputs, basically the client local weights are very large. They are like high dimensional vector. If you secret share directly on that, that will, that's gonna be very expensive in terms of communication. So here the trick is that uh, you can just submit the vector plus some small secrets or like small ciphertext and then this reduces the communication cost. Can you not do that? You could do the seed, just secret share the seeds, uh, mm -hmm. threshold secret share just the seeds, right? That, that would also work in the- Yeah, but you require the, like the PRGP homomorphic. So there are some works that designs uh, like secret aggregation protocol with dropouts based on that, but this is not the type of work our work uh, lies in, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Um, so I guess every iteration, like the PRG is using the initial uh, seed and the time iteration, the mm -hmm, ID of mm -hmm. the iteration yeah. uh, to generate the secret for that. 
So what if is there a synchronicity in the protocols? Like some clients think it's T versus some others think T plus one. Is that considered? Yeah, this is a great question. So in a semi-honest case, the server will just uh, tell the clients, this is iteration 10, this is iteration 11, and they will get the information from the server. And in a malicious case in our protocol, the server can lie the iteration and then uh, launch a cross round attack. So here we have one more round trip to use the decryptors to cross check the rounds. And if this check fails, the server is risking at not getting an output. And I guess like a quick clarification question. So there exists attacks, which basically if you see the aggregate across multiple rounds, then you can kind of figure out some of the values, private values of some of the clients. Mm -hmm. But I believe that is still outside the threat model here. Yeah, it's actually orthogonal to this work. So basically we'll focus on secret aggregation, but if there are attacks that purely applies for federated learning, then it's not uh, covered in this work, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.